Now, it might have been unseasonably mild up until now, but I've got to tell you, today, winter's really kicked in here. Tonight, will it be the crow or the raven? It's the final episode of Game of Crows. We find out which is the cleverest Corvid. And I'm delving into the lives of one of our most charismatic birds of prey. So grab a cuppa, snuggle up and get cosy, because it's Winter Watch. Hello and welcome to Winter Watch 2018. What's finer than hot chocolate on a cold winter's night? <laughs> I'll tell you what's finer than that. The best wildlife programme on TV. And we've got one for you tonight, coming to you live from the Sherbourne Park Estate here, run by the National Trust in Gloucestershire. Last night, we gave you Mark Arman at Kate Bush. Tonight, we're going to give you some astonishing science. If the science is going to burst your brain. It really is worth waiting for. It's going to be a great show and it's been a great day. We started off with the most beautiful frosty morning. Now, if you were up early like our cameramen were, then you might have been treated to this fantastic view. It's absolutely glorious with gorgeous muted colours. Very different from a few days ago when we had all that rain and mud. This morning there was lots of frost around. It was a chilly morning. It's basically the perfect frosty winter morning. Really stunning. If you were out yourself, you would have seen some of this. The sun was out, though, warming up that frost, melting it eventually, and the wildlife was out making the most of basking in the sunshine with that beautiful blue sky. I was up early. It was, it was really lovely, wasn't it? Beautiful. Yeah, Can you imagine morning. being that coot and throwing that icy cold water all over yourself <laughs> at six o'clock in the morning? That's how they got the feathers. Keeps them warm. All right, fair <laughs> enough. I, 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 um, we have, of course, got live cameras all around the Sherbourne estate and we've set up feeding stations and there's one down in the woods. Let's have a look live and see what's going on down there. Looks very mysterious, very Narnia-like, doesn't it? Nothing much there. Let's go into the other feeding station camera there. We saw a lot of action here last night with the, with the Munt Jack, and uh, mice have been coming in here a lot to feed. And let's have a look at what happened to the mice last night. Now, here's the mice. Now, do you see that in the background? An owl came in. We thought it caught a prey item, maybe evolved. But what has the mouse done? It's frozen, absolutely frozen solid. The owl departs, and now watch how long will that mouse stay there in a frozen manner. Almost five and a half minutes before it makes a move. Which is a very sensible strategy because this is pitch black and the owl is hunting by sound. So if the mouse moved, uh, the owl might have come and got it. So that's a very, very sensible strategy. Amazing. Five and a half minutes. Five and a half minutes. <laughs> Frozen <laughs> solid. I've seen something similar. On occasion, sparrowhawks sweep through and they disturb all the birds from the bird table. But if one of them doesn't go, it will just sit there and freeze. I've seen cold tits and blue tits doing it. Not for five and a half minutes, but for at least a minute. They'll stand there frozen, hoping that nothing will give them away. Any little movement won't give them away. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Really now, if you were watching last night, you'll know that we finally got to grips with some of the badgers here at Sherbourne. We didn't do too well in Spring Watch or Autumn Watch, but we collared three more of them. And this is, allows us to know exactly where they are. Having said that, there's a lot more activity as well. And just after the programme finished last night, we saw this at one of our sets. Now, this is the set where we have an animal collared, and we've named it after Mark Armand. In fact, that's Mark just bursting out of the hole and approaching that other badger. And immediately, they start some rough and tumble. Now, this isn't a full-on badger fight. If it were, two animals who've never met before, two males fighting over a potential mate, it, you'd know about it. There'd be lots of screaming, lots of very vicious fighting. This is play fighting that's escalated into an argument about who's top badger. This is about establishing a hierarchy. Ow. And we can see Mark there on the left-hand side is slightly larger than the other badger. When that collar was fitted, he weighed over 16 kilograms. That's a pretty weighty animal. And here you can see that after all of this bickering and nibbling, 
he chases the other male off. Why is that going on? Well, the females are just about to give birth, and when they do, they'll come into season and the badger mating season starts. And of course, you want to be top male badger at that time because you want to be the one to mate with the females. But, Chris, is it really like that? Do the badgers have a, a sort of a really tough hierarchy? Because they were quite gentle, really. They didn't really chase him off. They were, it was more like play fighting. It was a bit of play fighting there. They probably already established that hierarchy, and this was a bit of reinforcing it. Mm. I mean, we know that within a group of badgers, there's one breeding female, but it's, she doesn't just mate with the dominant male in that group, because at this time of year, male badgers will move from other groups to try and find those females, and we find that when we analyse their young, only 50% of the young are sired by the dominant badger oh, in right. their group. So these sneaky males that are coming in to mate with the females are scoring on 50% of the occasions. Not the only behaviour that we saw associated with breeding last night. On our thermal camera we saw this this is a female badger gathering bedding and again she's about to give birth beneath the ground one to five cubs and she wants to uh, you know produce those youngsters in a chamber which is nice and soft and warm and dry so at this year we, uh, time of year we see them taking quite a lot of bedding down it's amazing, isn't it? It fascinates me that we've really struggled to get any sort of shots of badgers at all in spring and autumn, and now we're getting all this fabulous behaviour of them on the cameras. Yeah, well, I think it is. It's all to do with the fact that it's breeding time, therefore you're getting all of this extra activity around the set, and that's where our cameras are. Whereas in the summer, when we got here in spring, the, the young had, been, uh, had already been born, they were mobile. Uh, by the end, of course, we got to autumn, they'd already moved off uh, to other parts of the set. But these badgers are behaving quite strangely here at Sherborne, and that's why we've got those collars on. We want to learn a lot more about how they're using these sets and the landscape, because it seems to be a little bit unusual. But badgers aren't the only previously elusive animal our thermal camera has caught. Have a look at this. This is another animal that we've really struggled with in spring. We could, we've got a little bit of it in spring, nothing at all in autumn. The fox, something popping up There's behind rabbit, the fox there. Now remember this is a thermal camera so you're seeing heat on the fox. Now it's, it's out hunting and I reckon it's worming. I mean that looked like a worm to me that it was pulling up. What else could it be that it's getting from the ground? It trots off and then it does what you'd expect your dog to do when you're taking it for a walk. It urinates. Look, you can still see the warm urine. Remember, it's a thermal camera. This is obviously its patch because it goes around urinating, but that urine is mixed with a scent that's specific to that fox. And once it's urinated, it rubs itself in it and so that all the other foxes will know that that's its smell and off it trots. But again, why do you think we're seeing more of the foxes now than we did in autumn? I mean, well, we again, really struggled, didn't we, in autumn? We did. I, it's a very difficult time for foxes, Chris. Yeah. You know, as they come into it, they're, they're awash with hormones. Their testicles double in size at this time of year. It must be terribly uncomfortable for them. The right testicle is always bigger than the left testicle. So that poor old fox has been living quietly, and suddenly all these hormones, these testicles are growing. Most uncomfortable time of year, I would say. It's remarkable gonad knowledge that you're delivering <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, just the thought I, the yeah. thing is, though, that the males, if they haven't mated with the females, this is just about their last chance at this time of year. Yes. Over Christmas time, we hear them, you know, uh, barking loudly, and then when they're mate, mating the, uh, themselves, they make an enormous amount of noise. So mm. this is probably a, a males moving around, last chance to mate, probably. I wonder if we'll get it on our live thermal camera. Our cameraman is out tonight on the thermal. Oh. Ooh. Woodcock. Woodcock! Oh, that's brilliant! Look, it always that. takes us a second to work Look out what it is on Look the thermal camera. Look at that! What a Two woodcock. Oh, oh that's gone oh, a bit fuzzy it. wuzzy. Oh, oh it's tantalising. A... Oh, oh no! <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, could be a... no. There they are again! There we go, you can Look see clearly Look at their bills, a great long bill. bill. That's a one. I didn't know we had one. Oh, no, we've lost it now. Well, that's great. And if well, we catch anything it. else on the live, then of course, they're worming we'll too. To they're yeah. worming they're just the like the fox. Yeah. Those are the wormings. Anyway, that was fantastic. Shall we have a quiz? Why Let's not? have a quick quiz. Okay, our cameramen were out and about and they managed to film this. What is this? It's not a, a little terrier called Nula. It's what is it? If you think you know what that animal is, Please get in contact with us on Twitter, and if any of you get it right, we'll let you know later on in the programme. I love a quiz, me. <laughs>
Now, in the wintertime, we enjoy an enormous influx of birds to the UK, typically things like wildfowl and waders, ducks, swans and geese, that sort of thing, but also a few passerines that can excite us. Some of you might have been lucky enough to have brambling in your garden. Last weekend was the Big Garden Bird Watch OSPB event. You might have spotted a few of those. Occasionally, we get waxwings coming in from Scandinavia, truly exotic and sometimes in large numbers. But there is one winter visitor, which used to be more common, is not so now, but Michaela and I went out at the weekend to try and get to grips with it. A very special bird indeed, the one and only Great Grey Shrike. I love a shrike. So do I, Chris, but I've never seen a Great Grey Shrike before. I'm actually more familiar with the Fiscal Shrike. Well, they're a very successful group of birds, aren't they? There are many shrike species around the world. But this is... Uh... This is a real beauty, if we get a good view of it, that is, of course. It's going to be a treat, it's going to be a tick for me. Well, it might be if we find it. We've got to find it first. Don't count your shikes before you've <laughs> counted your trousers, I don't know. <laughs> shrikes are really sight faithful, so when they find somewhere they like, they tend to keep coming back. So I guess we need to keep looking up. They like a high vantage point, don't they, shrikes? They do. And, of course, they've got their territories, so if you're in the right place, Again, there's a good chance you'll find it. Michaela? Yeah? This tree's got a shrike written all over it. Well, if you were a shrike, you'd be sitting in the top of that tree, would you? It's perfect. It's in the middle it of the is, heath. It? Yeah. It's got a great viewpoint all the way around. I'll tell you what, let's poke around underneath to see if we can find any prey remains. OK, what sort of thing are we going to be looking for? Feathers, fur, any of that sort of stuff, maybe insects. Look at that. Oh, yes. There's a little bit of beetle there, look. There is as well. And there... That's the abdomen of a hornet. It must be a queen hornet that's taken at this time of year. And these, I imagine, all of these would have been pellets, so they've been regurgitated just as owls and birds of prey produce them, and they've fallen onto the ground and the rain has washed them apart. You're quite a little Sherlock, aren't you, really? So I look for other stuff. Oh, look at this one. This is a goodie. You'll like this, Chris. Look. Oh, oh that is that a pellet. That is a pellet, yeah. Yeah. Must it's... be fresh, because yeah. it's not disintegrated in the rain. We're clearly in the right spot. Hopefully it's just a matter of time before it turns up. How long do you reckon we'll have to wait? Because you know I'm not very patient. Well, you have to be patient. That's part of birding. <laughs> it's an integral part of birding. <laughs> We're not the only ones, look. There's quite a few people around, isn't there? But you know, it's a, it really is a twitcher's bird, isn't it? Because it... I think there's only about, what, 60-something of them in the country at this time of the year. It's become a twitcher's bird, but, I mean, I hate to say it, when, when I were a lad, um, you know, they were regular every winter. And we'd go deliberately to see them, but we'd be the only ones there. There wouldn't be a crowd like this. This is turning into a, a shrike shindig, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> but it will be coming back. I have faith. A down with dog, see? Like that. That's what your poodle does. Let's go. One more scan. No, we're not going to see it Come on, it one more scan. We, OK, one, one more, more quick scan. scan. There we go. Looks. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. It's roosted now. I know my shrike. Listen, listen. At the, you know, I'd, I'd give anything at this point. I sell my soul. It's not worth much. But just for it to pop up so I could prove you wrong. <laughs> Well, maybe on the way back to the car. Come along. It's been right. a lovely day no, in I'm the coming. forest of Dean. I'm coming. <sighs> hate birds. I really hate birds. So what do you reckon? I reckon the chances are oh, good. Do you think so? Yeah, the chances are good. There are less people here, less dog walkers, less bird watchers. Oh, right in the top. Oh, I've got it, yes. Hey! Oh, look at that. It's such a gorgeous looking bird. Oh, that's superb. Yeah, they're very attractive birds. It's almost fluffy. Do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me a little bit of a long tailed tit. Do you know, I knew you were going to say it that. It does, it's sort of fluffy. This would eat six or seven long tailed tits <laughs> for breakfast, those little fluff balls. This is a proper bird, honestly. It's also got the name Jackie Hangman. Has it? Yeah. So you know when you used to play that game? You know, that Jackie Hangman game? Do they, someone calls this Jackie Hangman? Yeah. Who does? I don't know, a couple of friends of mine. 
Vai. <risos> Forgive me, but it's got to be done. <laughs> oh, that was a bird, wasn't it, eh? That was worth getting up twice in a row early for, wasn't it? Oh, I mean, it really was. is a fabulous looking bird, but it's also a very interesting bird because it's a voracious predator and it has a variety of prey. Now, this was actually filmed last year in the same area. Because their site's faithful, it's very likely that this is the same bird. And it's called a lizard. And then, as I say, variety of prey. This is the one that we saw, that Chris and I saw. This is this year. And it's called a beetle. And remember that we saw the remains of beetle under the tree. And it'll catch lizards, beetles, small mammals, even small birds sometimes, won't it? But yeah. it doesn't always just eat them straight away. And that's what makes it really interesting. Yeah, they're called butcher birds, uh, not only for their voracious appetite and their ability to kill lots of things, but because they actually produce larders they will store food now during the breeding season if there's a surfeit of food they they'll hang it up on thorns like this or even barbed wire fences and they might do the same in the winter here though i don't think it's a question of storing food i think it's a question of using that thorn which onto which it's impaled this bank roll as a tool because these are perching birds they're passerines they're not like raptors they haven't got big powerful feet they can't hold down that prey to tear it apart here, what they've had to do is pin it on that thorn so it gives it the ability to, to peck at that, that little vole. And they always go for the brain first, whether they're eating a bird or a mammal, whatever it is, they always eat the head first, I notice when I used to watch them. I've got a question for you, Chris. I mean, it's a fantastic bird. It's obviously, it copes in the winter here. So mm -hmm. why don't they stick around in the spring and summer? Why don't they just it's stay? It's an interesting question. A very good question. Because you, they breed throughout France, all the way through Germany, up into Scandinavia, much further north than, than even Scotland in, in, in the UK. So it's not a question of temperature. It's always bemused people. But there are old records of them allegedly breeding in the UK. Mm. Morris's British Birds from 1891 cites a number of examples around the UK. I seem to remember the depths of my mind somewhere. There was a case um, in the 20th century of them breeding in uh, Sutherland or Caithness and a few years ago there was a, a rumour that they'd bred in Yorkshire. So sometimes a pair will stick around. I think. It would be great to have them throughout the year because yeah, amazing. it really is yeah. a wonderful But they are declining unfortunately. So they've declined in their you know, natural part of their range. It's, it's just coming back to that thing about the lack of large insects because although they do eat birds and mammals and everything else they are reliant on those beetles principally and other large insects. Well, from a fabulous little bird to the magnificent golden eagle, Gillian's in Scotland where she continues to explore the wonderful wildlife of the island of Isla. Welcome back to Isla. Tonight I'm on the south of the island. To the left of me is Carrigfada Lighthouse. Those twinkling lights in the background is Port Ellen. We've just had an amazing time here. This place is incredible for wildlife. It finds you even when you're not looking for it. Yesterday, on our way to our location, we saw white-tailed eagle. On our way back, we saw barn owl. Today, while we've been setting up, we've had seals popping up, bobbing around, all around us, watching us, what we're doing. Last night, we filmed otters at a whiskey distillery, but that is not all we saw. Now this is a spectacular vista, but if you look really carefully in the top left hand corner, you can see there it is, it's a golden eagle. Now that's just not one golden eagle, it's a pair. That's a breeding pair and they're seen regularly soaring at parts of the island. Now winter is a really great time to see golden eagles. They make the most of these short winter days to be out hunting. And the more we watch them, we started to notice they kept coming back to the same spot. Now, if you look here, you can see they're really, really looking down, but we couldn't work out what it was. Golden Eagles are early breeders, so were they looking for nesting material? Was that prey? Was there a carcass down there? We simply couldn't see. So where exactly are we? I've got this map here. 
And this is where we were last night filming the otters up here. This is a little bit wet. And down here is the golden eagles. This is called the, the O Peninsula. This is a hot spot for golden eagles, one of the best places in the whole country to see them. And to really appreciate why, we've got to see this place in the daytime. Now, this peninsula is a mix of craggy moorland and farmland. Most of it is managed by the RSPB for wildlife, for the benefit of wildlife, and boy does it work. They're home to many rare species of birds, and those cliffs are the reason why golden eagles do so well here. It doesn't just provide amazing nesting sites, but the wind, which we are getting the full force of tonight, is another reason that bounces straight off the Atlantic into those cliffs, and it gives the eagle some much needed lift. Now to give you an idea of how this works, I brought a little something along for you. And check this out. This is a scale model of an adult golden eagle. Tip to tip, that is 2.2 meters long. That's as big as they get. And you can really see, I mean, this is magnificent. These are built to soar. And they do this. They use this wingspan through the spring, through the summer, to look effortlessly, cover huge distances for live prey. They'll take hare, rabbit, sometimes even seabirds. But of course, in the winter, live prey is scarce on the ground. So they have to make use of carrion. And this was our chance to get some really close views of the birds. We put some cameras on a deer carcass and we waited. It took us four days, but on day five, this is what we saw. On day five, the first eagle had landed. Now, the first thing you can really appreciate is the size of this bird. It's almost the size of a deer. Its first task was to get into the carcass. And very efficiently, it starts using that sharp beak to pull at the fur and strip it away. It took just 15 minutes, it's sped up, but just minutes to clear the whole of the left flank and now it just eats as much as it can and we timed that first sitting it took 37 minutes to absolutely gorge itself and in this next shot you'll see you can start to see even there that the crop is really filling out and eventually what you can really appreciate it's just tucking in and there it is check this shot that crop is absolutely ramful. It has gorged to the max. Now, a golden eagle can eat up to a kilo in a single sitting. If that was for my body size relatively, that would be the equivalent of a 28 pound steak. So you, we really started to appreciate this is a really important food source for them. But we were curious, how long would it take them to really strip that carcass bare? Well, we'll find out later in the show, but for now, it's back to Sherborne and to Martin. Thank you very much, Gillian. What fantastic pictures the team are getting up there in Isla. Absolutely wonderful. Just before we came on air, I spoke to a friend of mine who used to be the, the site manager up there on the air, and he told me an incredible thing. There were a pair of golden eagles up there. They used to hunt, they used to fly along the cliff and actually drive what feral goats off the cliff, killing them. He didn't see it once, he saw it loads of times. Those eagles are quite extraordinary birds. Now, we don't have eagles here, of course, but what we do have in Sherborne is a beautiful raptor, the red kite. And you may remember in Spring Watch, we followed the red kite nest. We got these really intimate views inside as the three chicks swallowed ludicrous meals. <laughs> but they got bigger and bigger, and they all three of them successfully fledged, which is fantastic. Now, in all probability, those three chicks are probably still around us here in Sherborne. They don't tend to go that far. In the trees around me now, in this light drizzle that sprung up, there's probably loads and loads of birds all roosting, all trying to find somewhere to snuggle down out of the cold in the night. But kites, red kites, don't quite do it like that. They tend to roost communally. And a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a communal roost, which is only about two kilometres away from here, to try to see what was going on. I didn't...
This is so frustrating because um, there's five kites here all going in, but the mist has come down and completely shrouded the roost that they're going in on. There must be a more, more here, more. And another one. There must be maybe 30 have come in, but they're all hidden in the mist now. But you can see that copse there. We're only about a mile away from the main studio. And if you came during the day, you might think, well, that's just an ordinary little copse. You'd be completely wrong, because that is where all these kites are pouring into as it begins to get dark. There's another one. You know, in a way, this is good. Because whenever we go out and film wildlife, we always wait till it's beautifully sunny and it always looks lovely. Sun always shines on TV. Well, it doesn't always. <laughs> you can just see them just flying in. They just seem to float, they're buoyed up on the air. So graceful. They must have a really clear map of the whole area because obviously they're coming from areas that are thick in mist now. Here's another one, right? Two more. And yet they seem to know exactly where they're going. And actually, if I look really carefully, there goes one in. I can see a couple just sitting there like ghosts in the mist. The mist seems to add to that slightly surreal look. It's sort a of perfect winter scene somehow. It was actually a really magical experience being there with those kites drifting in through the mist. But of course we couldn't really see inside the roost to find out what was going on. And what might be going on in there? Well, some people say that youngsters, young red kites, get together uh, and that's their way in the roost of getting to know each other because they do stay together for life once they, once they, once they actually do get together. <laughs> But, but so what we did to find out in a bit more detail is we got our thermal camera and we went down to peep properly into the darkness. Well, they're not pairing up. Here they are as individuals. What they do do is a lot of, of preening. Now they get particularly muddy feet in the winter and they often preening their feet, their feathers. Now also we were thinking, well, do they get together like starlings and wagtails? Actually, by roosting close together, they raise the temperature for everyone. They weren't doing that. You can see they're all separate in the trees here. So they're not warming each other up. So it's difficult to know what really is going on. I've got two questions. Why that particular copse? I've got absolutely no idea. There's lots of other copses. The other thing is, weirdly, every now and then, some of those birds, individuals, they get up in the middle of the night and fly to a completely other roost. What's that all about? Anyway, while we've been here in the last couple of days, we've been filming these beautiful birds in flight around us here in Sherbourne. And it's really good to remember that these birds very nearly became extinct. Red kites were extinct in the middle of the 19th century in, in England uh, and in Scotland, and they clung on just a few pairs in Wales. And thanks to the efforts of really serious conservation work, they've now managed to recover, and we've got about 1,800 breeding pairs, which is still a tiny number, really. So these sort of sights are these lots of kites wheeling around in the air. If it wasn't for the conservation, that would be empty skies. So they still need our help. Now, winter is a great time to go out and do a bit of bird watching or wildlife watching. So let's go out now with naturalist John Walters and see what we can find. Well, winter for me, I mean, it's a quieter time of year but there's still plenty to see if you know where to look. Our garden is in the middle of a 1970s housing estate. So it's probably not the best place to attract wild birds. But we've got a berry bush, a cotoneaster in our garden, which thrushes particularly light. This winter we've had red wings. Common migrant birds to Britain from Scandinavia. They don't like to be the first one into the bush that might get eaten by a cat or a sparrowhawk. So I put out some plastic models. One bird will maybe think, oh, there's some thrushes already in there. They'll pop in and start feeding. And once they're in there, the rest of the flock will join them. 
Red wings are really beautiful birds. They've got a lovely little red patch under the wing, which gives them their name. It's a real treat just to be able to sit on my doorstep and watch these usually shy, sort of mainly woodland birds feeding, you know, in my garden just a few feet away. I'm very lucky to live on the edge of Dartmoor, so I've got a whole range of different habitats where I can watch all sorts of amazing wildlife, even in the winter. I've been studying the Keith Potter wasp for several years now, and it's uh, one of my favorite insects. These wasps overwinter in little clay pots, which are attached to the gorse and the heather. Each female wasp will build one of those pots during the summer within about two or three hours. Through exploring the behavior of the wasp, I've got to know the heathland as well. It's really nice to be accompanied by some stone chats. There's often a pair which are resident on the heath. Beautiful little birds as well. The male with these lovely little white uh, neck patches. For this winter, there's been exceptional numbers of hawfinches. This is a bird I've hardly ever seen in Britain. It's usually just a fleeting glimpse. They look quite angry, actually. And they're big, bulky birds with an enormous great beak. Real characters. Coloured like autumn leaves, sort of pale cinnamon browns and greys and a bit of blue in there as well. You see the power of that bill, which it uses to crush up very hard seeds. And what it particularly likes are hornbeams. Quite acrobatic things. They'll sort of hang down and grab the seeds, often grabbing a whole bunch of seeds at once. Really, really fabulous to see such a shy bird at really close range. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. It's like in a big sleeping bag with all the other long-tailed tits. So many of them all fluffed up together that you can't really tell where one bird ends and another begins. Um, the only way to count how many of there are in the flock is to count all the tails sticking out. What better way to end the day, really? What an amazing sight to see. Really, really special thing. That is just adorable. Talk about cosy up. Have you ever seen that when they, they're all sort of I've never like seen it. I've seen, obviously plenty of long tail tits, but never seen them doing that. Neither have I. We'll have Amazing. to go on another birding mission, see if we can see them. But anyway, we've had long tail tits, we've had great grey shrike, we've had hawfinch. What more could you want? Because all those birds are birds that people get very excited to see. And although John had a hawfinch on his patch, they're really tricky birds to see. But this winter you could stand a chance because although we have birds that are here all year round this time of year a couple of hundred usually visit our shores 
But this year, we've had an influx of them. About 1,000 to possibly 5,000 birds have arrived to the UK from the autumn. So you've got a good chance of seeing them. And on Sunday, we had a tip-off that there were a few in the churchyard in Sherbourne Village. So we headed off with our binoculars and we were treated to this site. Now, this is UK's largest finch. Look at that massive, powerful bill. And with our binoculars, we certainly did get a really good sighting of it because they're usually very shy, very difficult to see. They're usually hidden in the upper canopy of a mature woodland. But we, we were lucky we saw a few beautiful birds. Another, another great tick for the week, really. I know, it? absolutely fantastic. I, have to, I just can't stress what Mikel is saying enough. If you haven't seen a hawfinch, this is the winter. Get your wellies on, get your binoculars and get out there. Look, Rare Bird Alert sent us this data this afternoon. So this is last year, this week, and the number of hawfinch sightings that there were in the UK. There were 12. This is the UK this year with the number of hawfinch sightings this week. 203 and as you can see there's very much a southerly bias to all of these sightings so you might have thought that these birds were arriving from further north like the great guy strike and so many of our other winter visitors but it appears that a storm in october blew these birds up from southern europe and it's there that they're typically more common because they feed on things like hornbeam and beech seeds and these trees are, are more common there as well but Look at this, you know, we think of ourselves as having pretty tough jaws, but if you bite into a cherry, <laughs> and you bite onto the stone, you could bite your teeth. But a hawfinch has the ability to crack open a cherry stone. What it does is have a couple of little pads at the corner of its beak to hold the stone in exactly the right position, it's got massive muscles that are anchored around the back of its head so that it doesn't pull its jaws apart. And it can produce the crushing power of 50 <laughs> kilograms. A 50 kilogram bite from a tiny little bird like this. It's extraordinary. Now, that wasn't the most scientific demonstration <laughs> that I've ever done on Winter Watch, but nevertheless, it does exemplify the fact that these birds have an enormous biting power. Oh, and one last thing. Eat your heart out, Sherilyn Fenn. <laughs> Lots of you have seen hawfinches around your patch. You've sent us in pictures. Let's have a look at some of them. You sent them in on Twitter. This is from Ray. He saw this hawfinch in Derbyshire. They've also been seen in Hampshire. This was seen by John Boggle on Facebook. And Steve Sankey. Now, this is interesting. He saw a flock of around 30 birds feeding on hornbeam trees around Ludlow. So thank you very much for sending those in. And as Chris said, keep looking for them. This is the winter to see them. If you were watching yesterday, you would have seen episode one of Game of Crows a rather medieval contest where we pit raven against crow to test their cognitive abilities. Well, it was an inconclusive. And we asked you which one you thought might win. The results of that poll are in. 61% of you thought the raven would prove to be the more intelligent bird, and 39% said crow. Let's find out now in the final episode of Game of Crows. <laughs> John Crow. Jamie Ravenster. Good to see you. A raven from Winterfell with news. Ooh, medieval tweet. Indeed. It says, Game of Crows, one all. All to play for. Oh, well done. Yesterday, the crows sped to victory, pulling swords from the Iron Throne the fastest. Straight in. Whilst the raven oh, made short work of the guillotine with his impressive inquisitiveness. But two tests still remain. Game three, the warm-up. This tests vision and memory. Important skills when caching and storing food. For this test, each bird must spot the one brightly colored soldier amongst the hordes before the two minute hourglass runs out. It's time to play. The Game of Crows. First up, the Raven. Brad, find your soldier. Where's the soldier? Where's the soldier? Where's the soldier? 
Oh, 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 oh straight oh, away. Oh, I say, who needs a dragon when you've got a raven? And it hasn't even got three eyes. And yet it spotted that soldier straight away in amongst the crowd and went straight to it. And now it's laying waste to the other armies. Why wouldn't you? Look at that bird of war. They have got very, very good eyesight, but more importantly, they've also got a very good memory. Bring on the crow. Here it comes. I'll okay. set the sands of time. OK, now find your time. Oh, he's, he's, he's in there, mate, before you even set the sands of time! What he's do you mean? He's faster! He's fa... Nice ones. Um, he was in there. You were still setting the sands of time and you missed it, mate. Went straight in there and got it. I'm afraid we're one up. 2-1. Two, 2-1, one. Two, one, yeah. 2-1 to the crow. To the crow, the old crow. With a brain 15% larger than the crow, on paper, the youthful raven should be doing better but can he at least even up the score? Well, the final test sees winter coming with ice and stone. Presented with frozen food sealed in ice, a rock and warm water, how will these birds get the meat and win the game? Will the raven's superior size and strength Beat the wily old crow. The key thing here is that this is brand new. They have not been exposed to this at all. This is a completely new experience for them. Should we turn over the Sansa of time? Over it goes. Bring on Bran. Come on, Bran. Bran. Come on. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? What is he going to do? Oh. oh, he's got it. No. <laughs> Testing everything, isn't he? He's. he's Oh, he's going to throw it off the edge no, no. and see if it smashes. Oh! Oh. <laughs> he's got it. Using the ground now. Let's bring him out. Here, bram, bram, bram. He's got it. Go on. Good man. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh man. Ah! No, that's oh, he's drawn blood. He really has drawn blood. <laughs> Oh, that bill really hurts. That's really Game of Thrones, That's that is, Game mate. Of That's Game of Thrones stuff, That's Game of Thrones now. Really? So he's, he's pinned it down. Oh, this is what we there. need. It's very difficult to pin down a bit of ice. He's just trying to use brute force, basically, isn't he? He's having real difficulty with that ice. Now, the sounds of time are... Hold on. Three, two, one. Out. Out. Well done, Bran. He got some food out of it. He used the smashing it to bits with his beak method and holding onto it with his talon. Partial success there. Shall we see what the crow can do, Chris? Got a small ice cube this time as well, though, mate. A little bit smaller? A little bit smaller because of the crow. Zim, Zim. Yeah, what's that? What's that? What's that? Good. Well done, Zim. Well done. It's a bit cold, isn't it? Come on, come on. Well done. I think he's more accurate. Look at that. Who'd have thought it? <sighs> He's definitely scoring. He's... Oh, he nearly put it in the warm water too! I think we might have judged that an accident, however. <laughs> you know, I must declare an element of honesty here and say that Zim has achieved this far more quickly than Bran the Raven. He did, yeah. So, thinking about these challenges, Martin, the Raven, a bigger bird, we know what they say. Sometimes the more power, the less grace. <sighs> And never was it more true, mate, than what we've seen today. And I think what we've seen here are birds with different personalities, not just a crow and a raven, but their higher cognitive abilities allow us to discern those personalities more quickly. So I'm going to have to uh, fall on my sword, mate. Go on, mate, I'll I'm hold it I'm going to have to do you. the decent thing and fall on my sword because the crow has trounced the raven. Much to both our surprises, I fancy. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs> I say, that's a big surprise, isn't it? You see, I would have banked on the raven. Bigger bird, bigger brain. Great reputation for being the most intelligent of all the birds on the planet. So along with 61% of you, I thought the raven was going to win and uh, we lost.
Yep, 39%. But you're nevertheless, right. nevertheless, after all of that camping around in medieval costume, there is a point to this. Understanding these birds' cognitive ability has meant that we've got some very dramatic new science to give you now. Martin, come on, this is astonishing okay, stuff. This is really astonishing. Now, it turns out that that the corvids, the crow family, appear to be as intelligent as some of the primates, the higher our own group. How can that possibly be, particularly when you look at this? OK, here is... Uh, that's the, exactly the correct size, scale size. That's a chimpanzee's brain size. Not a real brain, obviously. It's made by my mate Dave. Uh, and here is a crow's brain. How can it be that a brain that size can be as clever as a brain that size? Well, the very latest science has shown us how they do it. It's all to do with neural density. In other words, how tightly the neurons are packed into the different brains. In the crow's brain, it has 10 times more neurons per gram, gram weight, the chimpanzee's brain. So although it's smaller, it has much more densely packed neurons. And that is how that little brain can compete in intelligence with that much bigger brain. Absolutely fascinating. All of these years we've been using the term bird brain. And we should have been saying chimp brain. We could, yes. Man brain. Fantastic. And of course it's not just the crows where this relationship applies. Even birds that we might see flying around in our gardens, like the gold crest, have this similar sort of relationship. Now the gold crest here, they come into the garden in the wintertime, you might spot one. They weigh about seven grams. And they have a brain that weighs 0.36 of a gram. Now, the mouse weighs 27 grams and has a brain which weighs uh, 0.42 of a gram. Bigger animal, bigger brain. But the gold crest has got 2.3 times the number of neurons in its brain than the mouse has, which suggests, and it's untested of course, that the gold crest might be a more intelligent animal than the mouse. Twice as bright as the mouse it could be. Potentially. Potentially, that's the New case. science. New science. On a completely different note, are our brains, all animals' brains, change size as we grow, of course? Uh, now, look at this fascinating chart. This is the size of human brains as we grow. So here we are as a baby, the brain gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and now something frightening happens, because about the age of 40 here, our brains start to shrink, Chris. Oh, goodness I'm me. I'm afraid your brain and my brain are on the downward spiral, well, they mate. they are on the downward spiral, but they're also plastic. Our brains can change shape and function during our lifetimes. And, of course, what we've done, Martin, is rearrange some of those neurons to protect ourselves. And this gives us experience and ingenuity and the ability to recall things. So it's not all bad news, mate. It's not all bad. But what you see here, interestingly, is the female brain throughout is smaller than the male brain, mate. But that as we've be shown... Potentially controversial, of course, but what we've shown already is size is not important. It's density that counts. Size is not important. It's and not the course, size of your brain, it's what you do with it. Now. We've been saying say, that to ladies for years. Size is not important. But let's discontinue this anatomical conversation now and head over to Gillian and see how she's getting on with her eagles. Welcome back to the Old Peninsula on Isla. We've been following a pair of golden eagles, a breeding pair, and we put some cameras on a deer carcass in the hope that we get some close views. Now, we thought this carcass would last them for ages, but did it? Now, four days after the first eagle appeared, we noticed that most of the left flank was completely born. This deer is, was not that big. We estimate about 20 to 30 kilos, bones and all. But still, that was quite an incredible start. We noticed that they started to arrive, or at least this one started to arrive in the morning. It would have a huge feed, absolutely gorge itself after a, a cold winter's night. And once it was done, it was gone. Then the 4th of January was a really wet Isla day. Eagles rarely fly on days like this. It's terrible hunting weather, really tough conditions. So it was making the most of this find. Then we noticed a change in the routine. There were two visits, one in the morning and then one later on. Were these two different birds, a male and a female, very hard to tell apart. Either way, there was very little left, just skin and sinew. And then, on the 7th of January, this is a cold winter's morning, 
The eagle landed by the carcass as usual. Then what we saw next was amazing. In this shot on the top left-hand corner, there was the mate. And it sat there watching for 40 minutes. This was our proof that both birds were at least aware of the carcass, possibly feeding on it too. This was the last time we saw the pair and there was nothing left. So in just 11 days, we counted 14 visits. Each took just over half an hour. So that was seven and a half hours to strip a 20, 30 kilo carcass bare. Absolutely amazing. And all that meat was served one purpose, to get the pair into perfect breeding condition, which for golden eagles comes early, as we saw. Now this is a magnificent bird, absolutely built to soar. And what we noticed was that the pair started to play. They are tumbling, sort of flirting. This is the real, this is the beginning of the courtship ritual. There's masterful flyers. But it was the male that really started to do his stuff. He pulled his wings in and plummeted right down. And just before the bottom of his dive, he pulls up, climbs again, and does it again. Wings held tightly to the body, legs tucked in. Like this, he could build up speeds to 240, 320 kilometers an hour. This is the second fastest bird in the world. Only the peregrine is faster. And he wasn't doing this to impress his mate. This is a long distance territorial display, a message to males kilometers away saying, this is my patch, keep out. And the good news is that female has been successful at breeding for the last few years. So there's a really good chance that she'll be sitting on eggs by late March. Now, golden eagles are resident on this island year round, but some birds only come to these shores in the winter. Dawn breaks on the northeast coast. Wading birds have spent the cold night huddled together in mixed flocks. They've waited, not for the sun, but for the moon to do its work and turn the tide. Now, despite the chill, they must get going. But a tiny bird remains. It's a sandling. Despite its diminutive size, it's incredibly resilient. From summer breeding grounds high in the Arctic Circle, in winter, sandlings migrate south. Some even make it as far as Australasia. Not bad stats for one of the smallest waders on the beach. During the freezing winter months, sandlings must eat almost constantly in order to survive.
made up of minute crustaceans, such as tiny crabs and sandhoppers. But sometimes they chance upon a lucky find. business of foraging. These tiny birds must eat their fill before the tide begins to turn, and their dining table is lost to the sea once more. What a delightful film. Absolutely beautiful. superb, beautiful photography, and also a stunning little bird. 17,000 sandlings come to the UK every winter, all the way from Siberia. Top bird. Absolutely amazing. Now, right at the beginning of the programme, we set you a little quiz. We asked you, could you identify this particular animal? Now, a few of you have sent in answers. Chanting York's stork yoga said a baby deer. I don't think well, it could have been. Uh, Stephen Court said a long-eared owl. No. <laughs> I'm not sure you got that. And, and then Daniel Bramley, Danielle Bramley says, a very wet red squirrel. That's a good call. Mm. Lots of you did get it right. The first one to get it right was Oliver Andrews, Catherine Burkett got it right, Thomas Winston, Ian Lewis. Lots of you. Let's see what it was. All these people got it right. If we pull out, you can see that it's a wild boar filmed in the forest of Dean by one of our cameramen last week. Fabulous animal to see, 1,200 of them in the forest Lovely. of Dean now. Another wild boar. We've had an instant response to our item about hall finches from Phil Jones in Newcastle, who sent us this photograph. This is the bill of a hall finch, which he found under a peregrine feeding site. And there you can see to the left a pound coin for scale and a ruler. Top work, oh, Phil. Brilliant. I love that. I love that. And, that's and I'd love that the... beak to make a, a key ring. Can you imagine? Sorry, I'm speaking over Chris all the time tonight. So that came in during the programme. It did. Brilliant. And something Thank else that's come in that's Go been on. sent in, which come is on. absolutely stunning, because I love murmurations, is this from RSPB Minsley, where we were, of course, for three years for Spring Watch. This is a murmuration of starlings making fantastic patterns in the oh. sky. You know, the eagle eye, amongst you, you'll see there's a predator there that is cutting them all up. Fantastic. It looks like a lava lamp. To it me. does, doesn't Very it? Very sadly, that's all we've got time for. Do join us, though, immediately after the show for a Facebook Live with Lindsay Chapman on the Springwatch Facebook site. So that's coming up in a moment. Eight o'clock we're on tomorrow night. And what's on the agenda? Well, we're going to resolve our farmland bird feeding experiment to see which seeds were eaten by which birds. Gillian is in Isla exploring the lives of white-fronted geese. Should be a good spectacle. And I should be revealing the extraordinary, sometimes shocking life, sex life of the lesser horseshoe bat. So uh, all that to look forward to. Uh, uh, it's not that shocking, don't worry. It's, it's <laughs> but it's eight o'clock tomorrow. Eight o'clock tomorrow night. We'll see so you there. Some bats. You've got to be there. <laughs> Bye. -bye.